I bought every retro Nintendo system since the 1970s, well, every one I could get my hands on. I might run into some surprises today, but we're gonna start with the oldest systems that I could get my hands on, which is the Color Game 6 and the Color Game 15. Now I have both in box right here. They both came out on the same day in 1977, which begs the question, well, what happened to Color Games 1 through 5 and 7 through 14? But it's actually a comment on the number of games in the system, which is kind of a lie, actually. There's only tennis, volleyball, and hockey here in the Color Game 6, for example, but they counted two-player as three more games. But the entire thing is basically Nintendo's version of Pong. Just 21 different renditions of Pong, which is really quite amazing in its own right, really pushing the limits of, of what Pong can be. Color Game 15, you can actually take the controllers out and at purchase, both of these were advertised as being in working order and I'm super excited to announce that literally neither one of these works. Which is completely okay because two years later in 1979, Nintendo came out with Violent Pong, Block Kuzushi or Block Breaker, which is a completely original game and definitely not a copy of Breakout by Atari that came out three years earlier. Now this one does work and these old systems run off of RF. So I just need to plug this into the back of the TV. Plug this in here on the TV. <laughs> Can you hear the hiss? Does the hiss come through the audio? And I think I have this set. There's a little channel switch it's set to channel one. And there we go. These little dials here allow me to select what game I'm playing. And here goes nothing. Starts out kind of slow. Oh, the sound. Okay, this is actually a lot of fun. You can download these and play these on your phone nowadays, but there's just something about this, this little dial and just rotating it. It's the tactile aspect. And I'm gonna, oh, I got lucky there. Oh, 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 and the paddle gets smaller. It's so much harder with the tiny paddle. Huh? Also, for those of you who grew up with this, do you remember these old converters we used to have to use to connect games to the TV? I was able to find these at Japanese thrift stores for like 300 yen a piece. It's a little unfortunate that these didn't work. I found old schematics for them online. I might have to take them apart and try and fix them up sometime. Also, can't help but be impressed with these cables. This cable is over 40 years old, still connects to the TV beautifully while I'm replacing charging cables every couple months and they're, they're just sitting. There. I went through a lot to hunt this one down. This is the first ever Mario game debuting in 1983, just four months before the original NES or Famicom ever came out. And this is what it looks like. The Mario Bros, not brothers by the way, they're bros, work together to, I believe, load cake onto a truck? I, I, I think that's what's happening. Mario on one side, Luigi on the other, and you control both screens at once. It starts off simple enough, but it gets out of hand pretty quick. And when you mess up, you get yelled at. Managed to load an entire truck. This thing is... Oh God, no, it's going again? No, oh no. Even today, I kind of understand the appeal of this, but in the 80s, Japanese trains were packed with people standing around playing these, which are called Game and Watch. The very first of which was Game and Watch Ball. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that thing looks like it's in pristine condition. Well, I managed to get a very rare, not for sale version that was given away to platinum members of Club Nintendo. In fact, looking from the packaging, I don't even think that this one was even ever open. We'll give it a shot here. We'll try game A. I think, I think it's just a juggling game. It's a juggling game. How do you, how does that? Oh, oh, you gotta move both arms at the same time. Okay, so we're gonna restart game A. Wait, that's game B, it's so much faster. Oh my God. When you drop a ball, it says crush, which I'm pretty sure is probably supposed to say crash. And while we have the first ever Mario and first Game & Watch, if we want to go back to Mario's true origins, we need to go back to Donkey Kong, where he made his first appearance because Miyamoto failed to get the rights to Popeye, who he wanted as the original character. This is the Game & Watch version of the Donkey Kong game. 
It is the original Donkey Kong game where he's rolling barrels down and you as Mario have to jump over them to get to the top. But one of the things that I love the most about this one is this plus shaped keypad here. This game is the first time that a full plus keypad in a single piece of plastic was ever used and they're pretty much the standard for how long and it all started right here. I know I might be nerding out just a little bit too much, but... Now, as you can see on the back of the Mario one, there are a ton of these Game & Watch games. And they're called Game & Watch because when you're not using them to play games, there's a little clock inside the screen that can be used as a watch. Hence the name, Game & Watch. I think you actually have to like die in the game first and, just, and then hit the time button. There it is. And that brings us to a system that is so complex and wonderful that I'm considering doing an entirely separate video on the insane number of amazing accessories made for it. While North America got the NES, Japan got the Famicom. And it's way cooler than you might think. Now, a Japanese Famicom usually looks like this. But I managed to get my hands on one of the rarest ones in Japan, <laughs> built with a clear shell and AV outputs. It's always just something so exciting about setting up a game system. Them. And I cannot be the only one who misses the feeling of plugging those. This lab comes open and Super Mario Brothers. The controllers are connected directly to it. The controller feels a little... That music takes... The controller feels a little odd because I've never used the Japanese controller, but that music, that's just... <laughs> okay, okay, we... we... And to briefly touch on some of the incredible accessories that are meant to go along with the Famicom, this is the Famicom Basic. There's one more too. This right here, meant to turn your Famicom into an actual family computer with basic programming capabilities. This one was sold to me claiming that it had a broken space bar, but that everything else works fine. I have, I've never it says, who are you? Please put in your name. Okay, and yep, it just the space bar brought it right to the end. The, the other keys seem to work. It says, understood, you are space. This is who you are, okay. Would you like to try? And then... Okay, so it's not just space bar. None of this works, which is unfortunate, but it came with the data recorder. This right here, which has a handle. I love the Nintendo colors on it, despite it just being a rebranded Panasonic recorder. And while it does work as a tape recorder, it's got a whole speaker in here. It's meant to be tape storage for your programs for the family basic. I do have a cassette which says sample program three on the front and sample program four on the back. And there we go. Can't even get past the loading screen to see if we can try the sample program that's on it. And <laughs> I kind of love this about it. I don't know why I love this so much. There's something just so rough around the edges about it. While well, it goes in nice and smooth every single time that you go to eject it, it just comes flying right out. I kind of love it. By the way, I did try just playing to see what we get and this is all we get. That's it, just static hiss. But I love the look and the concept of it. So if we ever get our hands on a fully working set, definitely gonna have to give it a try. And then a year later in 1985 came the very creatively named Family Computer Robot. Nobody saw that name coming. Only two games ever made. I managed to get this one unused and untested, which has me a little nervous, but let's take a peek. I think he likes this box. He's. I think. It's probably why he was never used. Couldn't get him out of the box. <laughs> like, this isn't a bit or anything. I, I genuinely. I'm low key actually starting to think that they might not have used them just because they couldn't get him out. It's like Japan's humidity shrunk the box or something. <laughs> it's 
See, I can do this with confidence because I know it's never gonna come out. When I said we were gonna run into trouble today, I didn't, I didn't expect this to be it. Finally. That's the robot, but you still need the game. I'm super curious about this one here. If it works, it should be pretty interesting. I love how everything is still in its original packaging. It's got a space in the bottom for a couple batteries. Uh, he needs to face the TV. No clue how any of this works. This is actually surprisingly complicated. I have to attach hands that I'll probably never be able to get off. No! I'd actually wanted to try this spinner game that comes with these really heavy discs with injury warnings on them, and 90s toys with injury warnings are definitely something else, but it requires a D battery for the spinner, and I don't have a D battery. I'm gonna have to make a set of shorts on just these. I've actually started an entirely new shorts channel just to show off certain things in more detail, and I definitely think some of these items are gonna warrant their own shorts. Original packaging, I... Now he's got these photoreceptors in his eyes, so he needs to face the TV. Never heard the song before and it still feels nostalgic. Oh. I forgot to turn him on. Quiet, he is not. And I think we can just drop it right there. I don't know where to hold. I don't, like, don't want to hold them here because I feel like I'm holding by the neck. That is way too much fun. These are actually pretty hard to find right now. Every now and then you'll see them in a retro game shop, but more often than not, they've got a little sign on them that says not for sale. So I'm really, I love him. I really do. Got to give him a better name though. Any ideas? Now the disc system from 1986 is essentially steroids for the Famicom. It promised bigger and better games for cheaper. Mostly because these are cheaper to produce than these. Equally and perpetually interesting to me is that Nintendo started out with these, which are called Hanafuda cards. It is a traditional Japanese card game that I've never tried, but I should probably learn to play sometime. Now, the setup is pretty simple for it. The base is meant to sit underneath the Famicom, and then this unit gets plugged right into the top. And easy peasy, your disk system is set up and ready to go. <laughs> and hopefully works. I also love the Nintendo on the cartridge. It's not just us that it's actually functional. It lines up with Nintendo written inside the disk system to provide a bit of security or fight off piracy, if you And let's fire it up and give it a shot. Please set discard. They do have an A and a B side, so we'll put in the A side. Also, considering these are all Japanese products made for the Japanese market, the amount of English that is in every single product and on the packaging is actually quite surprising. Push start button. I don't even know if I'm doing this right. I've never played Metroid before. I've also got Super Mario Brothers 2. Oh, that's sneaky. You gonna put that in there and I can't even get to it? Oh. What is this one? Okay, I've I, I clearly have never played this game because apparently there's mushrooms that kill you in this one. I was clearly not good at that Mario game, but I did get what might be the best add-on for the disc system ever made. This is the 3D system which came out in 1987 and was only ever released to the Japanese market. Only eight games were ever made for it, which is still better than our robot friend, and the only one made by Nintendo was 3D Hot Rally. This game is actually where Luigi got the look we all know and love today of him being taller and slimmer than Mario. This was the first time Luigi was ever depicted like this. So you start out like this, a green twin basically. You plug this into here and the glasses get plugged right into here just like that. You start up your game, you put on your glasses, which are not only functional but very fashionable. And if the manual is to be believed, or even seen for that matter, you start the game and by hitting the select button, oh ho ho ho! Yep, that is, that is 3D. And, 
Okay, without the glasses, I'm now realizing that that was probably way more fun for me than it was for you. This is gonna be my first time ever trying the Nintendo Power Glove. This came out overseas in 1989 and in Japan by a different company, PAX, a year later in 1990. It was more styrofoam. <laughs> I am literally excited like a little kid right now. <laughs> so that goes like that. This just feels cool. It smells like 30 year old plastic. You can't tell me that doesn't look amazing. I have wanted one of these since I was five years old and my parents would, they're probably right not to get it for me, but still look at this. Okay, so according to the manual, this piece here needs to get set up on the TV. <laughs> I feel like it's gonna be easier without the glove on. And this should have plugged right into the Famicom. And we have one problem. No games were ever made in the Japanese market for the Power Glove. So we're just gonna try out Mario. I, I, have, I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh, okay, I, there's, there's a controller on here, okay. Start. <gasps> Start button works, okay. One player game, and here we go. Okay, and then how do I jump? <gasps> I use my thumb to jump. Oh, okay, we'll try again, okay. So backwards is this way, forwards is this way. We're making progress. It kind of defeats the purpose, but you can also just use the joy pad that's on it as well, which in some cases, which in some cases feels safer. Okay, all things considered, this is, this is a ton of fun. It always had a reputation for being a bit difficult to use and play with, but it has my heart. I found this Game Boy from 1989 at a thrift store in Kyushu, Japan, just sitting in a junk bin in box, claiming that the screen was unclear. I haven't even opened this one yet, so at this point it's basically just Schrodinger's Game Boy. Here's a blast from the past. It actually comes with the original Game Boy earbuds, the red and blue. Gotta start with Tetris, which was apparently such a huge deal that there was an entire movie made about it. Has anybody seen that? Let's give this a shot. How do you, I don't even remember. How, oh yeah. It seems to work completely fine. Maybe they just didn't realize that there's a contrast button on the side that you can adjust. You gotta love that Tetris music. All right, we're gonna go game to A type, all right. That works beautifully. And the original Game Boy came with this slew of accessories like the handy game machine rechargeable battery pack. This was a power bank for something made in 1989. <laughs> and amazingly, it actually seems to work. There's also this wide boy screen magnifier that I, <laughs> you just snap it on like this and then you zoom into your screen by extending the, I don't know if it actually does much other than add a ton of glare to the screen but back in the days there were accessories like these or the little light that you had to add to your Game Boy in order to play it at night because these things weren't backlit but this right here this this is how you survive long drives as a child oh one more update the the headphones they work <laughs> that is amazing 1989 and these thin plasticky headphones still work better than something that would come with an iPhone like 10 years ago. Now a year later, the Super Famicom came out in 1990 and it was the Famicom, but super. I got this one in case from the exact same thrift store that I got that Game Boy. And while I do have a bunch of games for it, I bought this one entirely because I found that Super Scope on sale for about a thousand yen and absolutely had to try it. And then that one didn't work, so I had to buy an entirely new one, oddly around the same price, because I was just, I was committed to the cause at this point. Just feels so official. Amazingly, the Super Famigo also used the same power adapter as the Famicom. If I remember correctly, this goes into the second player controller. It sits up here, and I think we're ready to go. I'm actually surprised I can play it at this distance. Try the medium level. Actually kind of nervous. Oh, okay. Oh. 
It's like a positive. This is so much fun. Honestly, I originally just bought it because it looks amazing and it just feels like one of those iconic Nintendo pieces. I'd never actually played with the Super Scope. And this, well, I guess we know how the rest of my night is going. Virtual Boy, released in 1995. As a kid, this was the coolest system ever until the N64 came out. It was a divisive system. Most people absolutely hated it, but weirdos like me were obsessed with the futuristic cyberpunk vibe that the all red and black 3D games gave off. I spent forever tracking down an in-box, unused system that came with a ton of games, and at this point, I'm just hoping and praying that it actually works. It's meant to be portable so it can run off of batteries. In fact, most of these systems, except for the Famicom and the Super Famicom, were actually made to run off batteries, as I don't think Nintendo expected people back in the day to have that many wall outlets available. That is pristine. And the stand for it looks like I don't even have a good description for this stand. <laughs> it looks like they took apart a camping chair for it. Games come on little cartridges that look like this and they slide right in here. And if you've never seen a Virtual Boy before and you think, well, that, that doesn't look like a Nintendo system. It was basically released incomplete. It was rushed, its team was cut down, and this is what we end up with. One of Nintendo's greatest failures and still to this day, one of my favorite Nintendo systems. There we go. That is what it sounds like. And it is visually just as eccentric and exciting. The entire thing is in full stereoscopic 3D. And while there's no real way for me to show you just how epic this 3D really looks, I can assure you that if you were anything like me, you would absolutely love this thing. And again, this Japan release, Virtual Boy, has almost all of its games and menus entirely in English. But the N64 will forever be the Nintendo of Nintendos, to, to me at least. It's actually that N64 up there that I found in box in a thrift store last year that kicked off this entire collection. And today I found us an in box Pikachu N64. Really well packaged one. Also managed to find Super Mario 64 and a bunch of inbox N64 accessories and Pikachu's cheeks light up. Wait, are they are they supposed to flat? I hope it, you know. Hope it works. <gasps> Sounds like it works. Oh, this takes me back. Somebody was already 15 stars into this game. Now, if you've never played an N64, one of the greatest challenges to it is that as the camera moves around you, you have to adjust your joystick to go along with it. <laughs> he, he just skipped that one. Your secrets have been revealed, my friend. Oh. Oh, you just made that jump. You know, I still haven't collected all the stars in this game, and you would not believe how much I love N64, even if I tried to explain it to you. I used to rent them every single weekend with the money from my paper route when I was a kid, because I didn't think I'd ever be able to save up for one, but there is one last item that I found, a Nintendo home run, in box, unused, and it's the last thing that we're gonna open up today. This right here is the Pocket Pikachu released in 1990. 98. Did anybody else have one of these? Oh, I don't want to rip the box. Every single Japanese visitor that I have had to my studio in the past couple of weeks has gone absolutely bonkers when they saw this. Seems the Pocket Pikachu was very popular in Japan. You can hear the pedometer inside. That classic plus, we all know where that comes from now. And amazingly, it still has the battery tag inside of it. Is this? Is this actually from 1998? Yes, it is. It's just in such great condition, it's hard to believe. And I just don't imagine we're gonna have much luck with a 25 year old battery, but here we go. I see stuff on the screen. And there I have my little Pikachu. I, I, don't, remember how to, I don't remember how to do any of this. 
what any of the buttons do whatsoever, but it works and I could not be happy. Well, that is, that is 100% getting clipped onto my, oh. <laughs> I'm loving, loving this Pikachu. I also found this Famicom and Super Famicom mini remake systems that have like 30 plus games in them each. We are definitely gonna have to do some shorts for the new channel and cover these things in more detail. But did you have a favorite? I'm just packing up the robot right now. I'm thinking, can you imagine what it must have been like to be a kid in Japan in 1985 and get to play with this? It's 2023 right now as I'm recording this and I'm loving every single, I don't want to pack it up. If I didn't have anything else to do today, equally amazing is that Nintendo's Ah, <laughs> uh, Norm. Pikachu fell asleep and I just want to say this video was so much fun to make. If there was anything that rang a bell for you, please, please let me know in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for hanging out for this one and you know I will see you again real soon.